Welcome to the How Did They Do It Real Estate Podcast. Have you ever wondered how people succeed in real estate and what steps they took to get there? If so, this podcast is for you. Your hosts, Sayla and Eileen Prack, interview top experts in the real estate community to share with you their real estate journey and how they achieved massive success. Our goal is to provide you with valuable real estate resources and to help you apply it to your own real estate goals. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's episode of How Did They Do It Real Estate Podcast. I am your host, Sayla Prack. Today, I am honored to be joined by Amanda Hein. Amanda is a CPA and tax strategist who specializes in helping people use real estate to save massive amounts of taxes and keep their hard-earned money. Amanda is co-author of highly rated book, Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. She has been featured in prominent publications, including Forbes Financial Council, Money Magazine, Talks at Google, CNBC's Smart Money Talks Radio, as well as Bigger Podcasts. So Amanda, I am honored to have you joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me, Sayla. Excited to be here. So Amanda, can you please share a little bit more about your background? Yes. So what I tell people is I'm a CPA by day and real estate investor by night. So I think similar to a lot of our audience that during the day, my company, Keystone CPA, we help work with real estate investors nationwide Mm -hmm. on how to use real estate to save on taxes. It's a really good setup because I myself am an investor as well, both actively and my husband and I have our own portfolio of properties that we're pretty active on, but we're also passive investors in a lot of syndication deals too. So I have a unique insight that when I help our clients with taxes, I also get to sneak peek into what they're doing doing and Mm -hmm. what else I can apply that to my own portfolio too. That's awesome. And Amanda, you mentioned that you and your husband, I know Matt is unable to join us today, also has a real estate portfolio as well. Can you touch base a little bit on that and how you get started with the real estate investing active and passive? Yeah, it's funny because I'm actually the third generation of investors in my family. So my grandparents invested in real estate. My parents dabbled in real estate a little bit. I grew up in the same condo community where my grandparents owned all the Mm -hmm. rental properties. And growing up as real estate was just not something that was really interesting or attractive to me at all. Again, because my grandparents were very hands-on landlords. So even when I was really young, I saw kind of a lot of the hard work in being a landlord and and living amongst the tenants. So for me, I just really wanted to like go to school, go to college, get good grades and get a great job. Real estate was never something that was kind of like in the stars for me, but I happened to end up at one of the big four accounting firms in their real estate group. So my job at the time was to help with high net worth, high income investors on how to use taxes to save money on their properties. But even then, I still didn't decide to do real estate until my husband actually, he read Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad book. And he said, hey, we should invest in real estate. And I really thought he was crazy at the time. You know, I was like, hey, I don't want to fix toilets. I don't want to get those 1 a.m. calls. It's just not something for us. But I'm really glad that we took the plunge and got into real estate investing. It mm-hmm. really has been life-changing for us. That's an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing that, Amanda. And as a real estate investor, like you mentioned earlier, you doing both active and passive. And also you having a company, CPA company as well, and you're working on that. So I want to touch base a little bit. Our W2 professional that's working full time and they did want to get into real estate. What are some of the strategy or tax strategy involving investing in real estate and which revenue would you recommend they should do? Yeah, that's an interesting because for me growing up, I always thought of real estate investing as being the landlord, getting the tenant calls and just not something I wanted to do. But really, when you get into it, there's so many different ways to invest in real estate, right? You don't have to be the one making offers, dealing with property related issues. There are ways to do that either through turnkey properties, out-of-state properties, or leveraging other people's expertise into larger deals like syndications. And from a tax perspective, 
especially for those who are high income earners, right? We all know that are very few things we can do to reduce taxes from our W-2 income. Unfortunately, that's the way the tax law is written currently. And so it becomes even more important for people in that profile with high income to start to generate other sources of income, for example, passive income from rentals, and start to be able to create more tax efficient income. Because with rental properties, we are able to take deductions, depreciations, and different write-offs to offset the taxes from the cash flow we're getting. And so even for people who are still working full time, have high taxes, it's even more important to make sure you start building that other passive income that's a lot more tax efficient. So Amanda, you mentioned about the tax deduction and depreciation. I know if our listener is listening to for the first time and try to get into real estate investing, how can they deduct all that from their taxes? Yeah, it's really interesting because I think you always hear that the tax code is really intended to help business owners, right? We all hear that business owners get all the tax breaks, they get all the write-offs. Well, the good part about being a real estate investor is that you are also considered a business in the eyes of the IRS. And what that means is if you have ordinary and necessary expenses as it relates to you being a real estate investor, then those expenses can always offset taxes Mm -hmm. from the rental income. So like if you have your own rental property and you buy a book on how to invest in real estate or you attend a real estate conference, right? Those are all things that are ordinary and necessary for a real estate investor. So those expenses can always offset taxes from the rental income that you're generating in that particular year. So that kind of makes sense. So I'm trying to put this all together. So let's just say I am a W-2 worker and then I want to start investing or building my real estate portfolios on a side. So do you recommend that I should create running it as like a business, like an LLC and then start investing? Uh, How does that work? Yeah, that is a great question. We hear that all the time. People want to know like, hey, I'm getting to real estate. Should I form an LLC? Do I have to form an LLC? And the answer really depends. But purely from a tax perspective, no, you don't have to have an LLC to take your business deductions. I know earlier I used the word business, like you're operating a business. So business from the tax perspective simply means that you're in the business of renting out properties. As an example, if you're a landlord, you have rental income, you can deduct most of these expenses regardless of whether you hold title in an LLC or you hold title in your personal name. So having an LLC is not a requirement for taking tax write-offs against the rental income. Having said that, though, oftentimes it does make sense to have an LLC for liability purposes. So, But it's really important for our audience to understand because that is probably one of the most missed parts of tax planning is people think that they need to have a legal entity like an LLC or a corporation to write things off. And you really don't. You need to be in the business of investing in real estate. And that could be as simple as me buying a rental property in my own name. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense. And for so that means that you mentioned earlier the expenses, we can actually use that and to deduct mm-hmm. as part of the investing as well. Can any of those expenses or the deductions or depreciation can be used to write off the active income as well? Yeah, great question. So for high income earners and high income earner typically for this purposes is defined as people making over $150,000 a year. The rental losses, assuming you're investing in long-term rentals, they typically only offset taxes from other passive income. So other rental properties, or if you're investing passively in other businesses, so typically rental losses are considered passive. So they only offset passive income. Now there is a distinction if let's say you you or a spouse is a real estate professional, and I'll define that in just a moment. But if you or your spouse is a real estate professional, then rental losses could potentially offset taxes from W-2 and other income as well. And so that's where kind of, you know, the best place to be is mm-hmm. if you have someone who's high income earner and then someone else who's a real estate professional filing a joint return. That's where you kind of see the benefit of both worlds. For a real estate professional, it doesn't mean that you have to be licensed in real estate or be a realtor, but it does have to do with the hours that you're spending in real estate and what you are doing with respect to your real estate properties. So a couple tests to meet. The first one is that you have to spend more time in real estate than your job. So if you're someone who's working 2000 hours a year, 
probably going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to say you Mm -hmm. do more than that in real estate, right? But if you have a spouse who's maybe like a stay-at-home or part-time worker, then that becomes more possible, depending Mm -hmm. on how many properties you own. So first rule is, again, more time in real estate than your job. The second rule is at least 750 hours in real estate. So this will apply to people who maybe don't have a job, right? And so so they have to have at least 150 hours in real estate. And then the third one is you have to meet material participation for your long-term rentals. And so those typically apply to more hands-on type of day-to-day activities with respect to dealing with your own long-term rental property. So once you or a spouse meets one of those, uh, all those three requirements, mm-hmm. then you are a real estate professional, the rental losses offset, not just rental income, but also W-2 income for tax purposes. Wow, that's amazing. And for the spouse that actually doing as part-time or becoming the real estate professional, if they own uh, rental properties, and you mentioned that they have to work as part of real estate investing, if the rental properties have property managers or asset managers that are actually managing that, would that count it as well? Or you have to actually doing something with the real estate or the property itself? Yeah, great question. So when we talk about hours for real estate professional status, that would be the hours of you as an individual. So what you're doing with respect to the property, it does not include hours of other people. So if you've hired a property manager, Mm -hmm. their hours don't count towards your hours. It has to be your specific hours on real estate. Now, it doesn't mean you can't also have a property manager, right? So we Mm -hmm. have a lot of clients who own a handful of rental properties. Maybe some of the out-of-state ones, they have property managers, they don't do anything with it, but maybe they have other properties that are local or closer to them where they're self-managing and they have enough hours that they accumulate, then it is still possible to be a real estate professional for tax purposes. So it just comes down to the hours and activities in that given year for Mm -hmm. that taxpayer. That makes sense. And Amanda, is there any things that the real estate investor should be avoiding when setting up like this or filing taxes for as a real estate professional or as a real estate investor that they should be watching out for so that they don't get audited by the IOS or get in trouble with the IOS? Yeah, I mean, for people who are looking to claim real estate professional, it definitely comes down to documentation. And so the way it works is you have to be able to show the hours and activities that's performed. Because if you're ever selected for audit, those are things that you need to prove as a taxpayer. It's a really important point because the IRS doesn't have to prove you didn't do it. You have to prove that you actually did those things that you say that you have done for that particular year. And if you're like me, I barely remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so it's very difficult for people to come up with documentation two, three years down the road, because that's typically, if you're audited, it's going to be up to three years from the date you filed a return, which would be four years even after the date in question. And so from that perspective, it's really important to make sure you have good documentation to support what you've done in the future. If you ever had to pull it up, you have enough detailed notes to be able to say, okay, this is what I did. And this is how I can prove what I did. And I know I deep diving into a little bit more details on that. So when it comes to documentation, what are some of the things that you would recommend real estate investor making sure that they have good documentation, like receipts, or is there any tools that they can, or you recommend that they can use in order to document all that? Yeah, it's funny because real estate professional documentation is one of those necessary evils. I talk to clients all the time who do real estate full time. And sometimes I'll say, do I really have to document? Do I really need to track hours? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. You do want to track it again because that's sort of your insurance policy, right? If you're audited and you don't have that documentation, then it's much harder for you to prove what you did. When it comes to documentation, the IRS, they don't have a specific way or method for you to track those. But what they do require is consistency. So meaning you have some sort of methodology for you, it might be in your Google calendar. In that calendar, you'll write down the dates, what you did, how many hours, which property it was for, right? And the cooperation of that evidence could be in the form of emails and receipts and things like that. Or if you don't use calendar, maybe you have an app that you use to track your hours. We have people who use notebooks, Excel worksheets. So whatever method works for you is going to be the key because you are the one who's going to be doing the documentation. Right. So find Mm -hmm. a system that works with you that you can use day in and day out. 
Got it. And Amanda, for us at the time of recording this podcast, we are in midst of 2023. Are there any rules or regulations in 2023 that actually got changed that real estate investors should be aware of? Yeah, the past couple of years we've had a hundred percent bonus depreciation all the way up until the end of 2022. Bonus depreciation basically just means that for certain assets that you are using for your real estate or even part of the property itself, for assets that are typically depreciated over five years, seven years, or 15 years, we have the ability to write it off immediately in that first year. So that was what was referred to as 100 bonus depreciation for people who have not already filed. 2022 taxes. That is still a strategy that's possible to use to accelerate write-offs. Now, fast forward into 2023, bonus depreciation is still available, so that's good. There's a slight haircut to it, so at this point, it's 80% depreciation. So it doesn't mean that we lose out on that 20% difference. Mm-hmm. It just means that if I have an asset that's eligible, I would write off 80% immediately, and then the remaining 20%, I'm going to write it off over the life of the asset. So if it was a five-year, normally a five-year asset. I'll take 80% of that right now. And then the remaining 20%, I'll take it over a five-year period. So still hugely beneficial. It is set or scheduled currently to go down even more next year to 60%. So for those who are investing in real estate in 2023, putting into service this year could be pretty significant in getting that 80% bonus depreciation benefit. We love hosting this show. When we started this podcast, we were doing all the editing and post-production ourselves. Now, we are very excited to have this particular company as a partner of the show to do all the post-production for us because it gives us the freedom to focus on the two things we care about, serving you, our listener, at a higher level and growing our own multifamily business. If you are like Sayla and me, then you want to add value to others while scaling your business. A podcast is the best way to do both, and we invite you to contact Adam Adams. He can help you launch your podcast, market your show for more listeners, and take all the post-production off your plate so you can focus on your business instead of in it. Listeners of this show can get a free consultation with Adam. To schedule your free consultation, find the link in the show notes. So Amanda, for bonus appreciation, I just want to elaborate that a little bit. And you mentioned that we can actually write off 100% for 2022 for those that do not file the tax yet. And for 2023, they can write off 80%. So our listener who wanted to get into the real estate investing for the first time, what does that mean to them? Let's say they buy a property for $100,000. Are they writing off $80,000? $80,000? How does that work for them? Yeah, great question. Unfortunately, we don't get to write off the entire purchase price or building of our property. There is a method you go through to calculate what the depreciation of the property could be. So normally, if we're talking about residential mm-hmm. real estate, those are typically over 27 and a half years. So you take your purchase price, part of that is going to be allocated to the building. Let's say our building is $100,000. Then that building, normally you depreciate it over 27 and a half years, right? But what you can also do is do accelerated depreciation or cost segregation. And that involves having a cost segregation firm break out the components of that $100,000 building. So they're going to say, oh, maybe $10,000 was for flooring, $5,000 was for appliances, and so on and so forth. And with those component breakouts, that is what's eligible for bonus depreciation. So in that scenario, if I had $30,000 in fixtures and furnishing, then maybe I can write off 80% of that $30,000 in 2023 as bonus depreciation. So still pretty significant in terms of upfront tax deductions. Right. And, and Amanda, it's for us, we also investing in the commercial real estate as well. And so a lot of time we can hear is that once we exit from a property, it's like, let's say, multifamily properties. And we usually we hear people saying that, well, I'm going to be owing a lot of capital gain. And what are some of the ways or your recommendation that real estate investors can do in order to reduce the capital gain liability? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because we do see, we are seeing this a lot where someone who's just working full time and they're just investing passively into syndications. And so in the duration of the investment, what happens is they get 
K1s showing large losses, right? Tax losses from cost segregation. And so sometimes the complaint is, well, I'm not able to use that to offset my W2 income because I'm not doing real estate full time or not real estate professional. And so when it comes time to sell this particular syndication investment, this is where the benefit comes in, right? So in the previous years, all those passive losses that you've accumulated, you can now free those up and use it to offset the capital gains on the sale of this particular syndication investment. For all investors, regardless of whether you're doing real estate full-time or you're just a passive investor, a really key thing to understand is even if you cannot use the tax benefits today, you always have the opportunity to use it in the future. And so when you have a syndication investment that sells, is a great example of when mm-hmm. that happens. And Amanda, I used to do the tax filing myself in the past. And I know now is that we invested in real estate and all that. We actually have CPAs to help us as well. But in your recommendation, if somebody wanted to start to invest in real estate, do you recommend that mm-hmm. they have a CPAs helping them and making sure that they capture all the losses, capture all the depreciation, and making sure that they filed it correctly? What is your opinions mm-hmm. on that? I think it really depends from person to person. For someone who maybe has a good accounting background, if you just have one rental property, may not be a huge difference in terms of having someone else to do the return. But if tax is not really your background, I do recommend having a CPA to help you with tax filing, just because sometimes if a mistake is made, Mm -hmm. it can be very hard to unwind, or it could be very costly to unwind. And unfortunately, I see this more often than I would like, where newer investors starting out, but they start out maybe with the wrong entity or filing the tax returns on the wrong form or the wrong schedules or not taking depreciation correctly, or maybe not even taking depreciation at all, right? Because they didn't know how to do it, or they didn't work with a tax advisor who specializes in real estate. So for newer investors, even though the immediate tax savings may not be huge, it still could make sense to work with a professional just from a proactive planning perspective to ensure things are done correctly and set yourself up right for the future. I agree. When I first started with real estate investing, when we purchased our first uh, turnkey properties, and unfortunately, the CPAs that we found at the time didn't know what it was a uh, depreciation was or anything like that. So when we file taxes, we actually owe taxes based on the rentals that we receive. So now, Amanda, how can our listeners looking for a good CPA, like a real estate CPA, can determine which one is the right CPA for them? Or how do they know like they should be working with Keystone's? CPA. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing is don't ask the tax person if they work with real estate investors. Because if you mm-hmm. ask that question, 10 times out of 10, the answer is going to be yes. And it could be because they have one client who rents out of it, right? Technically, that gives them the right to say, yes, I work with real estate investors. True. So you just want to ask more powerful questions when it comes to real estate. One that I typically tell people to ask is to share what are your successful real estate clients doing with respect to tax planning? And then just be quiet and hear what they have to say, right? Because you want to ask open-ended questions that really allow that tax advisor to shine. So they're going to tell you about their successful clients. That gives you an idea what level of investors they're working with. If their successful client story is someone who has two single family homes, then they probably don't do that much in real estate. If their successful client is someone who does syndications or owns a large portfolio of properties, and those are the types of strategies they share, then you kind of have an idea this person Mm -hmm. works a lot with real estate investors. At least they work with investors that I'm hoping to become right at that level. So I think just asking more open-ended questions for them to tell you about what their clients are doing, what are their successful clients doing, what are some tax strategies they're working on, or what are their favorite tax strategies for real estate. Those are all just better questions to pull out what their expertise and knowledge is in the real estate space. I also always encourage people to use real estate lingo because as real estate investors, we probably don't really know it or think about it, but we use a lot of lingos that Mm -hmm. are only for real estate, right? We talk about, I was talking to someone about ADUs. So putting an ADU on the property. So that's a question like, if you're talking to your interviewing tax person about ADUs, do they even have an idea of what you're talking about, right? That gives you a Mm -hmm. glimpse into how well-versed they are in terms of real estate. That makes sense. And Amanda, now I'm going to be asking that question. So what do you recommend the tax strategy for our real estate investor for 2024? You know, it's hard to say because tax law changes 
too often and too quickly. As we speak, there are still proposals in the budget on changes to 1031 exchange. We mentioned earlier about bonus depreciation decreasing to 60% next year. And even that might change, right? We don't know. Maybe they'll go back up. Maybe they'll go away. We don't really know. But I think from a planning perspective, the one thing that as investors, we want to make sure we do is simply keep that line of communication open with your tax advisor. So what I mean by that is it's really not your job to become the CPA as an investor. You don't have to learn about depreciation or how to calculate it. You don't have to learn about all the details of tracking hours for your real estate. That is what your tax advisor can help you with. But it is your job to make sure that you are updating your tax advisor before you implement transactions. So meaning let them know before you buy a property, before you sell a property, before you refinance, before you put it in an entity or take it out of an entity, turning a long-term rental into a short-term rental, right? Those all seem kind of small on its own, but those are all examples of when significant tax opportunities might arise. And so it could be as simple as a three sentence email or a 15 minute phone call with your tax person by you updating them, they can then jump in and like I said, they can shine and kind of tell you and advise you on here are the different things you should be thinking about for 2024, right? To maximize that tax saving. Right, right. And Amanda, so what is next for you and Keystone CPA? Oh, that's such a great question. I think we've just been on this phenomenal growth in the past uh, handful of years. So projection-wise, probably more of the same. As our business grew, we haven't had as much time to dedicate to our own portfolios. And like I said, I'm in a very unique position where we are able to leverage the expertise, the knowledge, the network of other real estate investors who are much better than myself in by putting some of our money into more passive investments too, right? Like what you guys do in terms of syndications. And we see that not just like for us, but as well for a lot of our clients too, who are still passionate about growing their business, but also don't want to neglect the wealth building part of it. And so it's important um, to understand there's so many different ways to invest in real estate. And so you just kind of pick a couple of them that works well for you. And like for me too, something that worked in the past may or may not work this year and my strategies for investment next year might be even a little bit different than what it is for this year too. Right, right. And Amanda, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but you're working with a lot of your clients. Do you see that now in the mid 2023 and potentially like going to the end of 2023, are they still like actively investing in real estate or do they think that real estate is still one of the best asset classes that they're investing in? You know, I think I'm going to have a biased opinion because our clients are all real estate focused, right? So it means right. from people who just do syndications to others who are still maybe physicians, attorneys, and kind of just starting that real estate journey as another way to build wealth. But I can say from our clients who are more full-time dedicated to real estate, what's really interesting is that the acquisition of real estate actually slowed down for part of last year. So for parts of last year, a lot of people have exited, gotten ready with the cash. And then coming into this year, we're seeing more people, again, people who are full-time in real estate are more excited to redeploy that money for more acquisitions, which is, mm-hmm. I think is a very different than word on the street. Right? Word on the street, there's a lot of fear, mm-hmm. uncertainty about interest rates, about the market, but the people who are heavily involved in real estate, I think are more excited. Volatile interest rates, softening of the market are things that they're seeing as opportunities mm-hmm. rather than something to be fearful of. Right. And Amanda, so my final question, you and your husband, Matt, very, very successful CPAs and very successful real estate investors as well. So your day must be jam-packed with a lot of tasks and follow-up things. If our listener listening to us right now, how can you do that? What some of the things that you deploy in your daily lives to make it possible? Yeah, I'm a big believer of systems and processes. We use that both in our business, because like you said, we work with clients all over the US. And because we focus on planning, we're not a traditional CPA firm where they only work January through April and close down for the rest of the year, right? We're pretty much busy all year round. And so it's really important, I think, for us to make sure we have systems and processes Mm -hmm. on how to do things correctly, how to do it correctly the first time. And of course, on the business side, it's really our team who handles a lot of 
of the heavy lifting and the team and the processes and the systems is key to making sure all of that runs smoothly. And from an investment perspective, I really apply that exact same theory. Like I said earlier, right? Real estate investing is a business. Again, not an LLC or S Corp, but just it's a business. And so with respect to being an investor, you want to have those same systems, processes, and team members in place, right? So you're not the contractor, but you want to have the good contractors. You're not a CPA, but you want to have a good team of CPAs. With your CPA, you're going to have a system of Well, every time I buy something, I'm sending the closing disclosure to them. Every time this happens, I'm going to communicate, right? So it's the same thing. And I think that really helps to streamline a lot of things and take yourself out of the day-to-day rat race, if you will. Amanda, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I really appreciate you. I know if our listener wanted to find out more about you, your company, where can they go? Yeah, I mean, if you want to get daily tax tips, the best place to find me on social media, Instagram as Amanda Han CPA. I'm also on Facebook as well. If you are interested in learning more about how to use real estate to save on taxes, you can download. We have a free tax savings toolkit on our website at keystonecpa.com. And there we talk about how to pay your kids to take a tax deduction, more about the real estate professional status. We talk about the short-term rental loophole, which we didn't get to cover today, which is a very powerful loophole for those who are working full-time still, but wanting to get into real estate on the side. So yeah, all that great information you can download from our website at keystonecpa.com. And we also wrote a book called Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor, which you can find on Amazon, Bigger Pockets, or any of your local bookstores too. That's awesome. Amanda, thank you so much again for your time. We really appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And thank you for listening to our podcast today, brought to you by Bonavest Capital. We would really appreciate it if you can go to iTunes right now and leave a rating and written review. Also, please don't forget to subscribe so you can always get the latest episodes. You can also connect with us on Facebook, How Did They Do It Real Estate? We'd love to hear your feedback and any topics that you're interested in for future episodes. If you're anything like Zayla and me and believe that real estate investing is a great way to create passive income and build long-term wealth, check out our free apartment syndication due diligence checklist for passive investors at bonavestcapital.com forward slash checklist. Zayla and I created this checklist for ourselves as we evaluated different multifamily syndication opportunities as a passive investor. So we would love to share it with you so you can use it as a resource as well. Download your free copy today at bonavestcapital.com forward slash checklist. Lastly, to learn more about us, you can go to bonavestcapital.com and fill out the contact us page so you can speak to us directly. Nothing on the show should be considered as specific personal advice. Please consult your legal, tax, and real estate professionals for individualized advice.